This is the 12th sermon in our series on the fall of Babylon. <clears throat> we want to consider this morning Babylon's merchants. This is a, an important matter to consider, and this is uh, her merchants are mentioned several times in Revelation, the 18th chapter, which is the judgment, the fall of Babylon. <clears throat> so we want to take some time to look at this. Although Babylon is depicted in uh, Revelation chapter 17 as a woman riding upon a beast, we know that Babylon is not a, a single person. Ba that's not what Babylon is. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit chose this particular imagery to show us the character of Babylon, which in this picture she is a, a pompous and a shameless harlot. That's the way she is. <clears throat> and also Babylon is described six times in the book of the Revelation as that great city. But we know that Babylon is not a geographical city. It's not isolated to one particular place on the earth. <clears throat> and even the Holy Spirit chose to depict Babylon as a great city because it operates like a city. It has a, a lot of people that are involved in many things. There are residences who, residents who live there and businesses and there's infrastructure for the city and it's, it's like a big operation. And the citizens that live there are proud of their city and they're happy to dwell there. So it's, it's, uh, it's pictured as a city in another place. <clears throat> but we know that Babylon is not a geographical city but a spiritual city which cannot be located on a map. <clears throat> Babylon's People and infrastructure are all motivated and controlled by Satan, who is seeking to overthrow what God is doing in the earth. We understand from her origins, described in Revelation chapter 12 and 13 and 17, that Babylon is the product of the devil, that old serpent. <clears throat> and my personal conviction is that spiritual Babylon has now covered the face of the earth in our day. It's not limited to one place, one location, one kind of people, one particular de denomination. It's not like that. It's, it's a great spiritual city that has covered the whole earth. And every, it's everywhere on earth and set to oppose the gospel of Christ and the work of God. <clears throat> the fact that Babylon is not an isolated phenomenon is one of the things that becomes apparent when we study her merchants here in Revelation chapter 18. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And verse 17 speaks of every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea. And verse 23 says, For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. So these words used here indicate to us uh, the magnitude of Babylon. It's why it's a great city. It's a very large, encompassing operation. <clears throat> so obviously, like any great city, Babylon's a great enterprise. <clears throat> she has ties with the kings of the earth. The merchants of the earth who bring their merchandise to her from all over the world by land and by sea, they have been made the great men of the earth only simply because of their business with Babylon. That's how they became great. <clears throat> and like any other city, uh, every city has to need to do some kind of business outside of the city, and especially a large city because large cities that are populous need a lot of supplies and a lot of enterprise that can't be provided within the bounds of the city, so there have to be people from outside bring in supplies, and there's trade done outside of the city. <clears throat> now this is even true for the city of God that is in the earth. The church of God, we, we certainly are not self-sufficient of ourselves here. If we have everything, for example, if, if we have everything we need right here, then, then why would we bother having to pray about anything, right? So we, we certainly, we're not ashamed to admit, we depend on resources from outside ourselves. This is just a, a principle of the thing. <clears throat> James says that every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, <clears throat> with whom is no variables, variableness, neither shadow of turning. Grace and truth were brought to us by Jesus Christ, who came from God out of heaven. Repentance was granted unto us. It was given unto us to believe. 
when Jesus ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men. Zion certainly has suppliers, but not merchants. <clears throat> in a way, all the people of God are suppliers in Zion. Each of us receives some good things from the Lord, and we bring it and share it with one another, or we publish it and supply our brethren with what we've been given. And ultimately, in, in this in, the, in Zion, all good things come from above. <clears throat> but before they come to us, they might have come through another brother or a sister or one of the holy prophets or one of the apostles. It might have come through a book or a message or a song or a hymn and etc. We could go on. But the saints joyfully acknowledge the ultimate source of whom we are, what we are, and what we have. <clears throat> I love the way the Apostle Paul sums this up in Ephesians 2, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Oh, when I read this, you think of what, what you've received from God outside of yourself. This, these things have been given to us of God. <clears throat> Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ, giving even more in the ages to come. Amen. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, this is a completely different spirit from the one that controls Babylon. <clears throat> no one in Babylon admits where their resources come from. In, in fact, most people in Babylon, I don't think, know where their resources come from, which is the devil. <clears throat> because Babylon is built upon an infrastructure of deception. Yeah. That great city, Babylon, produces people that are unholy, that are not repentant that do not believe what God has said, and that produce rotten fruit, and that do not honor Christ. And yet, they say they are the people of God. And they say that they are of the same Holy Spirit, and that God is their Father. <clears throat> now, in order for this kind of religion to prosper and to be sustained over a long period of time, <clears throat> there has to be a continual supply of resources for this kind of operation. Now, if you remember... Uh, the message from a few weeks ago <clears throat> about the text in Jeremiah where he says, we would have healed her, which we gave consideration to the heavenly resources that were available in Babylon. <clears throat> the people of God were in Babylon. They witnessed of God's goodness and they tried to heal Babylon as we have tried. And we know that in order for Babylon to reject the things of God, there has to also be a supply of something else there that the people are interested in to keep them there. <clears throat> this is where her merchants come in. Babylon's merchants specialize in supplying things to the people in that great city that appeal to their carnal natures and distract them from being healed. In plainer words, they supply the things of the world to the people in the churches so that they will continue in the sickness of sin and unholiness and rejection of the truth. Something from outside the church has to be brought in to distract the people away from the gospel and away from Christ. Now, they should be supplied from above, but instead they're being supplied from beneath. This, again, reminds us of things spoken to us by the Apostle John in his first epistle, considering that there are only two sources from which everything comes, ultimately only two sources, either God or the devil, <clears throat> heaven or earth. Submitting to one will lead you to heaven, lead you to heaven, submitting to the other will lead you to hell. That's just the way it is. <clears throat> one source causes men to bear, to bear good and holy fruit, and the other source causes men to be unholy and bear rotten fruit. One source supplied the love of the truth and the love of the brethren, and the other source supplies hatred for the truth and of the brethren. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. 
Now, one of the most things, uh, most difficult things that we've noted before is that it's, it's very difficult to identify Babylon. <clears throat> That's because, as we've said, she's not what she claims to be. That's why it's so difficult. <clears throat> she claims to be the bride of Christ, but in reality, she's a harlot. <clears throat> she claims to be of God, but in reality, she's of the devil. One of the ways to identify her now is by examining her merchants. <clears throat> so I want to, mostly today, this is going to be a series of contrast. I want to contrast <clears throat> Babylon's merchants with Zion's suppliers. First, I want to start with the difference between the sources, the most obvious difference. Everyone is supplied from one of two ultimate sources, either God <clears throat> or the devil. Now, God in heaven is over all. This, the scriptures make this very plain. The 103rd Psalm says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Without limit. Over all. <clears throat> when Jesus wanted to, he sent his disciples out and, and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. So, that, so God is over all. He can do as he pleases in heaven and in earth. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.18, I just love this very succinct, pithy statement that Paul says here, and all things are of God. Mm -hmm. You can't think of anything. There's nothing you can think of that ultimately did not come from God. All things are of God. <clears throat> so now obviously what the point I'm going to make is this is the source you want. You, this is the source you, where you want to get your goods from. <clears throat> now if, if a person fails to acknowledge this, that God is over all, then they must, by default, serve the devil, who is the other source. God has given Satan to be the prince of this world, and until the world passes away and the new heavens and the new, th new earth appears, <clears throat> he is the source in the earth. And even Satan knows that he hath but a short time. So armed with this fundamental knowledge, why would anyone settle for any source other than God? knowing that the other source is going to perish. <clears throat> All things are going to be reconciled unto him, and Satan is going to be cast down into hell. So there's quite a vast contrast between these two sources. Now the second contrast between these two sources has to do with proximity. This is especially apparent in Revelation chapter 18. <clears throat> Babylon's merchants come from all over the earth to sell their merchandise. Things listed in verses 12 and 13, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen, purple and silk and scarlet and all thion wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments, frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and the souls of men. You can't get all this in just one place. This is, this is from all over the world. It's brought into Babylon. So it represents a great accumulation of worldly merchandise <clears throat> brought from all over the world and from all periods of time, too. We could look at it that way. <clears throat> Her merchants come by land and by sea, laden with the things designed by the prince of this world to be used in the churches. <clears throat> in order to have a successful business, you know you can't make your customers angry, so you give them what they want. <clears throat> and Babylon's merchants are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. <clears throat> Say, friend, I've got something just for you. I've scoured the earth, and I've, I've got this plan here. If you read this book and you follow this, this will give eternal life. If you just you follow these however many steps it is. <clears throat> you know, it's so good doing business with you. I really look forward to seeing you every time, and I'm, I'm just so glad to help people. I sell these products to help people. That's what I'm all about. And I just look forward to every time I meet you, and, and you can pay by credit card or online, however you want to. But now, now look at these. <clears throat> Are, do these Babylonian merchants, do they really care about the people of God? Are they in this because they care about the churches and about the people. <clears throat> to look at here in Revelation chapter 18, verses 10, 15, and 17, this point is emphasized, as Babylon is falling, they're standing afar off. 
Why aren't they there in, the, in that great city with everyone else? They're standing afar off for fear of her torment. They are completely detached from Babylon. The only reason they're there is for business. <clears throat> Why are they standing far off? Why aren't they in the city? Why are they weeping and wailing for the loss of Babylon, that mighty city, and saying, Alas, alas, <clears throat> what is like unto this great city? Well, the answer is found in our text, which Brother Judah read. The merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. That's why they're upset. That's why they're standing afar off. Uh, again, we're contrasting sources here. This is Babylon's source, where they got all their supplies from, and when she falls, they're standing afar off. We don't want anything to do with that. If it were not for personal profit, they were in it for personal profit, not to help the people. Babylon's merchants, no matter how nice they appear to be, are the sellers of Satan. It's a strictly business relationship all along, and when Babylon falls, her merchants' personal gain will all be lost. Now let's contrast that with those who supply in Zion. Every single one of Zion's suppliers live in Zion. In fact, they were all born there. In Zion, there are an innumerable company of angels, the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and the spirits of just men made perfect, which all includes the holy prophets and the apostles, some of her chief suppliers. Not only they, but Zion is called the city of our God. God, the judge of all, and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, dwell there at all times. The ultimate source of all good things, the one of whom are all things, is pleased to dwell in Zion. Amen. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. There is no strange detachment between God and his people as there is between the devil and Babylon. Among God and his people, there is the sweetest and closest of fellowship and communion through Christ and in the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. This communion is such that Zion's ultimate source, God the Father and Jesus Christ his Son, meet and sup with us at the table that he has prepared. Amen. Now there is nothing like that in Babylon, only a phony appearance of such things. See how Babylon is like this very weird, strange city like no other. <clears throat> she claims to be of God, but God is not there. And her suppliers and her source, neither one live there, and they will stand afar off when she falls. She is depicted as the great whore because this is the end of all harlots. <clears throat> she will give herself to anyone, and many merchants will come to do business with her, but when her time comes and she falls, she finds herself completely alone and desolate. <clears throat> Notice also that Babylon has merchants, not just suppliers. Now the word merchants implies money or some kind of personal profit involved. <clears throat> a merchant is a business person, a capitalist. In other words, her merchants do what they do for personal gain and for no other reason regardless of what they might say. Babylon is a spiritual business. That's like an oxymoron, but that's what it is. It's a spiritual business. It is a defiling mixture of religion and worldly gain. Here's the way to explain it more simply. This is the way Babylon operates. <clears throat> Babylon is an imposter church, so it operates within the churches in the name of God, but her business is to blend the world with the church. One of the patented trademarks of Babylon is that her churches are full of worldly-minded, ungodly, and unholy people. These are the people that are invited and welcomed in Babylonian churches. Now, in order to keep these people in the churches, the people have to be kept satisfied with the things they desire. And in order to keep worldly people satisfied in the churches, Babylon requires a steady supply of merchandise from this world. She must have merchants who sell her the things she needs to defile the church. 
Not only are the ungodly kept satisfied in Babylon, but if there are any there who are otherwise minded, if they stay long, they will soon be defiled too. And they'll be dragged down and defiled by the constant appeal to the flesh that's there. Now, to, to simplify this business, we would call it rebranding. <clears throat> For example, Brother Bob builds cabinets. Now, if, if Brother Bob were to build a set of cabinets, and I either take or buy those Bob cabinets from Brother Bob, and I, I put my name on it. See, these are, put my little, this is Blakely cabinets, <clears throat> and I resell them. Well, this actually, this is not illegal if there's an agreement. Yeah. In, in our country, if there's a business agreement, you can do that, but this there's no agreement. This is the way Babylon works. Right. She takes the things that actually they're of the devil. That It's just plain talk here. The, the things that she uses are of the devil. Yeah. She takes the devil name off. She puts a Jesus sticker on it. Right. And she sells it to you. Amen. That's exactly what's going on in Babylon. <clears throat> but if it sounds like the world, then it's of the world. If it looks like the world, it's of the world. <clears throat> What they say about it is beside the point. If it's of the world, then it is not of God. Now, obviously, in a system like this, Babylon's merchants are selling these things for gain, not to help people. Her merchants are those who have gotten rich selling Babylonian products, products that mix the world with religion. Her merchants have no love for Babylon. Her merchants are not interested in the gospel. They have no desire for Jesus or love for the people of God, Babylon's merchants are in it for the profit. <clears throat> That's why they stand afar off when Babylon falls. It's strictly a business relationship, but now the time will come when the merchants will be judged, and that's not far off. They will be judged in the great judgment day. They'll be able to stand afar off when Babylon falls, but they won't be able to stand afar off in the great judgment day. <clears throat> Now again, let's contrast this with the way things are traded in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Many nations brought the natural resources and riches of their native lands to Solomon, who is somewhat of a type of Christ, at least in this <clears throat> instance. <clears throat> but they gave it to him in tribute as, as gifts of honor and to increase his glory. <clears throat> Babylon also receives all kind of resources from among the nations, but they are sold to her by merchants. None of it is free. Jesus told his disciples, freely ye have received, freely give. The kingdom of God does not run on money. There is nothing that God has that can possibly be bought with money, and there is nothing that can be sold to him for money. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? I realize here that this word freely means also abundantly and without measure, but he does say give freely, not sell freely. <clears throat> Living for God in this world will indeed cost you something, and it might even cost you some money. We don't deny this. <clears throat> But you can't buy anything from God with those things. The manner of the heavenly economy is God gave first, so we gave. We give. God first loved, so we love. Jesus laid down his life, so we lay down ours. Jesus became a servant, so we become the servants of God. And no one makes any money off of this. <clears throat> The price of our redemption was paid with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, for ye are bought with a price. <clears throat> God bought us. We don't buy anything from God. He is a rewarder and a gift giver. One of the first things Jesus did when he ascended on high was to give gifts unto men. And these things, again, cannot be bought with money. You recall it, Simon <clears throat> The sorcerer wanted to buy the, the ability to give the gift of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. <clears throat> Simon, there is something very wrong if you think you can buy this with money. You cannot serve God and mammon. Amen. But in Babylon... Everything runs either on money or some other kind of strictly personal profit. 
In fact, in Babylon, without the money system, there would be no church. How could young preachers and teachers be raised up without a Christian college education first? And how can the colleges survive without contributions from the churches? How could the preacher preach the gospel without money? Where would all the teaching curriculum come from if there were no money to buy it? How could the evangelist win souls without money for their journey? Money for musical instruments and sound systems, projectors and screens, and a full-time college-trained music minister. How could the churches possibly worship God without this? Without generous contributions of money, how can the churches build and keep their gymnasiums and community centers, without which precious souls cannot be won to Christ? Money is needed for new high-tech signs out front and to pay for a bigger parking lot to accommodate those seekers who are looking for God. Have you ever noticed that in Babylon, preachers are always called to a bigger church, never a smaller one? <clears throat> We kind of snicker at these things, but this would be like, this would be a good sermon here in most places. People would be, amen at that, yeah. They, this, is, this is the system, this is the great city, this is the way it operates. <clears throat> and for each of these things and more, Babylon must go to her merchants for these supplies. I did, uh, just out of curiosity, I did an internet search using, using the phrase church builders. And you would not believe the number of results. Church builders, over 48 million. Now I know that that's just a Google search. That doesn't mean that there are 48 million companies that build churches, but it does indicate that there's a very great interest in this category. Over 48 million results for church builders. Just by comparison, okay, let's look up praise and worship. There was only 10 million for that. So this, again, I, some of these, these hits on the internet might have been articles or information, all, but the number indicates that church building is a very good business these days. <clears throat> very good business for Babylon's merchants. There are also music merchants, sound system merchants, merchants who write programs for plays, skits, dramatizations, merchants who specialize in schemes for making churches grow in number, Merchants who sell plans for buildings, how to collect money from the church members, kids programs, training for elders, training for deacons, programs for pastors, retreats, conventions, recovery programs, Christmas programs, praise bands, audiovisual software and programs, Sunday school material, Bible study material, all the denominational periodicals, and on and on and etc. Take away the money from the mega church and it becomes a mini church at best, if they don't cease to exist altogether. And again, almost none of this is free. Yeah. All of these products have the flavor of the world. It looks like the world and it sounds like the world and it's based upon worldly business principles, worldly wisdom, worldly science, and worldly desires. Babylon's religious system has created a very large, exceedingly large cash flow in the churches. Now, I also acknowledge that there are also very good and profitable things that can be used for the saints that are purchased with money <clears throat> to benefit the people of God. Not every church is in the business of making money. Not every church sells the things that they have for the people of God. There are churches who record their preaching and send it out for free, and we're thankful for people like this. And it does cost them something, but they give it for free. This is more in accordance with the Spirit of the Lord. <clears throat> it's not sinful to buy recording media and this kind of thing and equipment and to use it to edify the church of God. That's not what I'm suggesting here. I'm not suggesting that it's automatically sinful to write a book and pay to have it printed and put it up for sale. That's not what I'm saying. It is lawful to use the world as not abusing it. <clears throat> One of the differences in what I'm talking about here is what is being sold. <clears throat> is it of God or is it of the earth? Does it edify the saints or does it bring profit to the flesh and the carnal desires? <clears throat> now the merchants of these things, I've just been talking about money thus far, but the merchants of these things are not Babylon's only suppliers. <clears throat> there are others who promote ideas 
and theories and ways of thinking that exalt Satan and play upon the carnal nature and draw men away from the truth. This may not cost you money, but it'll cost you your soul just the same if you listen to these merchants. These are spread around the world by businesses and schools and universities and places where people are taught to think in a certain way. I'm speaking about ideas that unleash the flesh and deny the God that made us. And, and I'm talking about these are brought into the churches. Ideas like the freedom of speech and democracy and the origin of species and evolution humanistic psychology, feminism, and not only liberty, but the right to indulge in all manner of fleshly appetites in private or in public. Mm -hmm. Babylon borrows these ideologies from the world and uses them to develop doctrines that are taught in the churches. She gets them from the world and she puts the name of God on them and gives them to the people in the churches. These are doctrines of devils. In effect, they deny the Christ that bought them. And these are the things that we're warned of in the Holy Scriptures. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And Second Peter says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Why is the truth evil spoken of? Because even the world can see there is no difference between them and the people in the churches. These ideologies and doctrines should have been stamped out by the churches before they could spread, but instead they have been given the seal of approval by the churches, employed by the churches, and have proliferated because of them. Worldly strategies for business and marketing are now used by the churches. Babylon is the mother of harlots and abominations in the earth. She didn't stop the godless abominations. She gave birth to them and nourishes them along. Now again, let's do some contrasting. Contrast this religious system with the record of the people of God. Let's start with our Savior who walked this earth. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He said of himself, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. When asked about paying tribute money, Jesus had to miraculously bring forth a coin out of a fish's mouth to pay his and Peter's taxes. Peter and John confessed, We don't have any silver and gold. <clears throat> Paul was a tent maker and, and through that had to provide for himself and those that were with him at times. <clears throat> and contributions were taken up by brethren from all over the world for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Everything done in the churches of God is done unto edification of the brethren and to profit withal and to build up the body as a whole, and to strengthen and lift up others, and to present every man perfect in order that God might be glorified in us. So when it comes to personal gain, we acknowledge that there is a certain prize that we are in quest of, but it is not to be obtained in this world, nor is it of this world. The Apostle Paul speaks for all the saints when he says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, <clears throat> either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are left behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the pro for the mark 
for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. The personal profit of the saints is the profit to be had in the day of judgment. When we hear our Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. <clears throat> I will make thee ruler over many things. We desire treasures in heaven where there is no moth or rust or thief. For those who seek the glory, honor, and immortality given in Christ, they shall receive eternal life. One of Jesus' promises to the churches is that to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcome and am sat down with my Father in his throne. Now Babylon has nothing like this to offer. <clears throat> Her merchants cannot sell us these things. You'll notice also in Revelation 18 that when Babylon falls, her merchants weep and mourn, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. In other words, the only market for their stuff was in Babylon. <clears throat> the world didn't want their merchandise, and the church of God didn't want their merchandise. The things they sold were a unique defiling mixture of the world and heaven. No one wants that kind of garbage except Babylon. As a result, when Babylon is judged, all her merchants will be out of business. Yes, amen. The fall of Babylon is not necessarily the death and destruction of cities and people. That's not what we're talking about. <clears throat> it is the judgment of God upon a religious system. It will be the end of the influence of the devilish Babylonian spirit in the earth. I don't doubt that a lot of churches will empty out. I don't doubt that a lot of merchants will be out of business. I don't doubt that there will be great turmoil and confusion in the churches, the Babylonian churches, because of the fall of Babylon will be the fall of what they think is normal and acceptable to God. The fall of Babylon will be the end of defilement in the churches and the end of the reproach of the name of the Lord in the churches. Amen. The wicked spirit that motivates Babylon will be stopped. The light of the truth will shine all over the world, and no man will buy from Babylon's merchants anymore. Now that does not mean that there will no longer be any opposition to the truth or to God in the earth. <clears throat> it does not mean that no one will oppose the truth, and everyone in the world is going to repent and believe the gospel. That's not what we're saying. In fact, the indication in Scripture is that opposition to God from the world is going to increase. The fall of Babylon means that the opposition won't be in the churches anymore. <clears throat> That's why Revelation 18 tells us of the fall of Babylon as the fall of a great city. With all its machinations and workings and infrastructure and involvement, the whole system is going to fall. Notice that there's no language about people being in torment or dying in Revelation 18. All the city is said to burn and to smoke. The text says nothing about any people being in the city or what becomes of them. Again, that's because the Holy Spirit's describing the fall of a system, a way of thinking, <clears throat> a way of defilement that comes out of the false church. <clears throat> I saw the dead... Small and great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. This is when those people who did not come out of Babylon <clears throat> will receive their due punishment. <clears throat> I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, that is, don't buy anything from Babylon or her merchants, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I want to close with this final word, to the daughter of Babylon from the prophet Isaiah. <clears throat> Stand now. Just a little background. You recall in Babylon, they were Babylon was well known for their soothsayers and magicians and their astrologers and this kind of thing. So this is kind of what Isaiah is addressing here. Some of her merchants. <clears throat> 
Stand now with thine enchantments and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be thou shalt be able to profit, if so be thou mayest prevail, thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. Thus shall they be unto thee with whom thou hast labored, even thy merchants from thy youth. They shall wander every one to his quarter, and none shall save thee. Amen. Amen. Amen.